Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you've all had a good week. So today we are going to be talking about teenagers using an online messaging app and it all went completely and horribly wrong. And at the center of this case is a very popular messaging app called Kick, which has over 300 million users. Like I couldn't believe how big this app was. At one point, approximately 40% of the teenagers in the US were using this app. 40%, that is crazy. However, the app has one big problem. It is absolutely full of child sexual predators. New this morning, have you heard of Kick? Within minutes, she started receiving random messages from strangers. I'm 29 and I wanna be your boyfriend. How obedient are you? Because Kick allows users to remain completely anonymous. It is completely unmoderated. The app has a dating element that is very sexually charged. And all of this is being marketed at teenagers, which makes what some people have called a predator's paradise. And then one day back in 2015, an 18 year old college freshman called David Eisenhower started using this app. And then whilst he was using this app, he started talking to others, started up a little relationship with another user called Nicole Lovell. The problem was that Nicole was only 13 years old. She was a 13 year old middle school student and he was an 18 year old college freshman. He essentially groomed this young girl online. And along with the help of his equally evil friend, Natalie Keepers, everything would end in tragedy. And this case really does highlight the dangers of the internet. I mean, obviously we talk about this all the time, but the internet does a lot of good, but it is also an incredibly dangerous place. So that is what we are going to be talking about today. So let's dive in. Before we get started, I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, and that is ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that will keep you safe and secure online. And it is so easy to install and use, and it works across all devices. I pretty much have it running in the background at all times. So for my security concern viewers, which I am I'm sure there is a lot of you. I would highly recommend using ExpressVPN when you are using the internet. But there is also another amazing benefit to ExpressVPN, and that is that it allows you to unlock content from all over the world. And I cannot even tell you how useful this is for me when I'm doing these videos. For example, just last week when I covered the case of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, there is a new six part docuseries on the case, and I tried to watch it in the UK, but I couldn't. So using ExpressVPN, I changed my location to the US and then it was available for me to watch on YouTube. Like it literally is that simple. And I'm always telling you what I'm watching from different countries. However, I have a recommendation for all of my viewers outside of the UK because I just watched an amazing drama series that is based on a true story called Mr. Bates versus the post office. And it covers the story of one of, if not the biggest, miscarriages of justice in the UK. The story follows hundreds of just ordinary people that worked in the post office and they had their lives completely destroyed. They were accused of stealing and some of the people involved got criminal records, they got fines, some of them were even sent to prison and they were all completely innocent. And then there was a whole cover up involving the government, like it's a whole scandal and it is all anyone is talking about in the UK right now. So if if you are in the UK, highly recommend it. But if you are outside of the UK, all you need to do is use ExpressVPN, change your geolocation to the UK, and then go on ITV, because that is the channel that it's on, and go and watch Mr. Bates versus the post office. And if you love British TV, if you love a good British drama, then I highly recommend that one. And if you guys wanted to try out ExpressVPN for yourself, keep yourself safe and secure online, and unlock content from all over the world, then you can go and get three months of Express ExpressVPN for free by going to expressvpn.com forward slash Danielle or just go to the link in my description box. So I just want to thank ExpressVPN again for sponsoring today's video but thank you to every single one of you guys watching right now because without all of you guys I wouldn't get opportunities like this and now let's jump into today's case. David Eisenhower was born at some point 
1989. An exact date of birth is not known. And he grew up in Yakima, Washington with his parents and younger sister before he then moved to Columbia, Maryland. Now growing up, there's not really that much to note about David's childhood. He had what would be classed as a very normal childhood. He was a very high achiever though. He was a very good student. He was well liked by his teachers, by his peers. There was no trauma or abuse in the family that we know of. And as David moved into middle school, David became a very talented distance runner. He competed at various levels. He won so many titles, so many awards. He really was that kid that had everything going for him because he was academically intelligent, getting good grades, but he was also athletic as well. He was named runner of the year many times. He has been described as mentally tough. There are even articles written about David in the local newspapers because he was doing so well with his running. Tell you about one of the greatest <laughs> distance runners this state has and his name is David Eisenhower. I make my personal goals achievable or just out of reach of achievable. That way I'm always constantly striving to better myself. However, according to David's peers at school, when he did start to get some recognition for his running, he got very cocky. And it wasn't like a confidence thing because there's nothing wrong with confidence. It was arrogance. It was cockiness. It was all like, look at me, look at me, look at how amazing I am, shoving everything into people's faces, going on and on about how good he was. But then there's another thing that is worth noting about David's personality. And that is that he was very concerned with his image and not like the way he looked exterior, like his character, what people thought of him. He wanted to make out that he was this quote, all American perfect boy. He cared deeply if others liked him, what they thought of him. And this definitely plays into this case a lot. But David did struggle a little bit. He has been described as incredibly socially awkward. Other students have said that David, he couldn't like pick up on social cues. He was difficult to talk to because he just wasn't very good with small talk. He struggled with eye contact, that kind of thing. He would very easily misinterpret conversations. And sadly, he was bullied for this. People teased him a lot because he just seemed to miss the point of everything. He was always kind of the last one to figure out the joke. However, despite all of this, David did make it through high school without too much of a traumatic time. And as soon as he graduated, Graduated from high school, he enrolled in Virginia Tech University where he was studying engineering. And this is where the rest of today's case takes place. So once David had enrolled at Virginia Tech, this is where he befriended another freshman who went by the name Natalie Keepers, who is another very significant person to today's case. Now, Natalie was born in 1997. Again, an exact date of birth is not known. However, she's the same school year as David. And growing up, Natalie had a very similar experience at school as David. She was very, very gifted, very talented. Natalie also came from a very religious family. She would attend church every single Sunday. And she did a lot in the community and with her church. She kind of was involved in everything in the school. Like for example, she was on the math team. She was on the junior varsity soccer team. She directed school musicals. She took part in Model United Nations. She was a crafts leader at her Bible school. She volunteered at her middle school teaching children. She also helped build homes for those in the community that couldn't afford it. It's like literally she did everything. And she seemed to be very, very good at everything as well. In fact, she graduated in the top 15% of her school. And then she enrolled in Virginia Tech. And according to her LinkedIn page, she had interned at NASA. Yeah, hopefully that puts it into perspective on how intelligent she is. And at Virginia Tech, she was double majoring in aerospace and ocean engineering, not easy subjects. So hopefully that paints a good enough picture of what Natalie was like. She was basically on this pedestal. 
However, being on such a pedestal, being good at everything and having so much pressure on her, she did suffer with her mental health. And this is where she has a very similar experience in school as David because Natalie has always been described as socially awkward. It has been described that she was a bit of an outcast, much like David. She was also bullied in school, just like David. And this led to mental health problems. She did suffer quite badly with anxiety and depression. She did also self-harm. And later she did have to go on medication. And also, this is not confirmed, so I do want to stress that. However, it is thought that while she was at high school, she did have a quite controlling and abusive boyfriend and he degraded her self-worth, just made her feel not good about herself. He was obviously abusive, controlling, and that can have a very negative impact on a person. And again, this will be very significant to this case. So following high school, both David and Natalie head off to Virginia Tech and it's a fresh start for both of them. You know, they both haven't had the best experience at high school and it was when they both went to Virginia Tech that both David and Natalie became quite close friends. Now it turns out that David and Natalie didn't first meet in college. What is just so crazy is that they're actually from the same town. They went to different schools. Their schools were about five miles apart, but they were from the same town, Columbia, Maryland. So at some point during their high school years, they bumped into one another, possibly at a social gathering at schools or maybe a party and they bonded because they are very similar and apparently the two of them had a fling. It is rumored as well that when Natalie did attend Virginia Tech this is when she split up finally with her abusive boyfriend. So Natalie at this point was quite emotionally vulnerable and this kind of led her directly into the arms of David. She was very very easy to manipulate and she was was not in a good place and let's just say David if you couldn't already figure out because obviously he is the main perpetrator of today's case David is not a good person not at all so when they first met up again at Virginia Tech they started up their fling again but it is said that Natalie became obsessed with David like obsessed wouldn't leave his side and it soon became clear that Natalie would do anything and everything for David. It is kind of weird to me how quickly she became obsessed with David. I'm talking instantly she would follow him around, do anything for him, be his little lapdog. But anyway, they're both in their freshman year and they're being typical students. There's probably a lot of partying, drinking going on. They're both 18. And now this is where we get to the main events of today's case. Because at some point during his freshman year, David downloads a messaging app called Kick. And this is where everything would start to go wrong. Now, what is Kick? Because I'm going to be completely honest, before this case, I had never heard of it. So Kick is kind of like WhatsApp, Telegram, one of those kinds of apps. It's just a messaging app. It's free to use. You can send an unlimited amount of messages and apparently it is very popular amongst teenagers, which is probably why I don't know it. And it also apparently has an absolutely terrible reputation because it is one of those apps where you can remain completely anonymous. All of the messages are encrypted and you don't need to give any personal details when you sign up. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to give your date of birth. You don't have to give your phone number. Like it's not linked to your phone number. It's not like WhatsApp or anything like that. You just sign up and you choose your username and that is it. So you really can remain completely anonymous. And because of that, it is an absolute haven for predators. Basically, Kick is known to be a messaging app for pedophiles. It has a huge child exploitation problem. In fact, the BBC recently reported that Kick, the app, has been linked to over 1,000 child abuse cases in just the space of five years. And of course, because it's known to be an app for pedophiles, whenever law enforcement try and track down pedophiles that have used this app, maybe they have some evidence that pedophiles have used this app, they go to Kik and say, hey, can we have the details of this user? Kik refuses to hand over any information. And because you literally sign up with no information anyway, it leads to a dead end. Even when Kik users are convicted 
pedophiles, the app still refuses to delete their profile. New this morning, have you heard of Kick? Authorities are concerned it may take longer to get a child predator off Kick. Even when they're convicted pedophiles and they shouldn't even have access to social media, Kick is basically just opening the door and saying, oh, come on in, let's have a group gathering of all of these pedophiles. It drives me insane. It shouldn't even be called Kick. It should just be called Pedo. And the app also has a dating element to it as well, kind of like Tinder. This app, I cannot stress how dangerous it is. There is apparently a feature on the app where you can live stream to anyone in the world. Like you can randomly live stream kind of like Omegle. Have you heard of that? Again, I'm not really familiar with all of this. I'm 80 years old inside, okay? So I'm not familiar with all of this, but I have heard of Omegle. While Kick kind of has an element of that in it as well, kind of like speed dating with random people online. And these live streams, if they're popular, enough can get pushed to the top of the app and God knows what these popular live streams could actually have on them because most of the time they're nearly always full of very explicit content which is obviously being viewed by vulnerable young teenagers. It is just a complete recipe for disaster but this app is apparently popular amongst teenagers because apparently it's parent proof. And at the time of this case taking place in 2015 the app Kick had nearly 300 million users and apparently up to 40% of the teenagers in the US were using this app which is just an insane amount of of teenagers. And there have been so many terrible news stories around this app. Take a look for yourself. You only have to Google kick controversies and so many will come up. And I've just pulled some here just to give you an example if you don't go away and Google. In 2016, a man was sent to prison for 25 years because he took sexually explicit photos of himself with a two-year-old child before he then shared all of these images across kick. In another case, two pedophiles were thankfully convicted because they were using the app kick to try and adopt a baby for them to have sex with the baby. In another investigation, it was discovered that there are nearly 200 groups on kick dedicated to child abuse. And these groups have names like kids and babies where pedophiles would join these groups and they would just freely share indecent images of children amongst each other. It is completely unregulated and they can do it all anonymously. And the app basically consists of teenagers and possibly children and predators. And in some cases as well, because there are so many predators on this app, they convince the teenagers to take indecent images of themselves to then share on Kick. It's such a vicious cycle. And this company is known to be so problematic. However, the company doesn't want to do anything about it because they're rich. The company even at one point was valued at $1 billion. And the app still continues today. I don't know how popular it is today, but it's still out and about. I wouldn't recommend using it though. Sorry that that was kind of a very big side note on the app kick, but I felt like it was important to really make it clear the kind of app we're going to be talking about. Especially as well, because I didn't know what this app was because I am an old woman inside. Maybe some of you are too. So maybe some of you didn't know what it was as well. So hopefully we're all on the same page right now. So David downloads Kick and he starts to use it. And David is kind of the rarity that he is still a teenager himself. He still is vulnerable, but he's also a predator. Yep. So David began to use Kick and he would anonymously message people from all over the world. And then we get to the fall of 2015. David is literally just about to finish his first semester at college. And this is when on Kick, he started to message a stranger who had the username Nicole Lovell 1514. Now, unfortunately, we don't know the exact nature of David's conversations with the user Nicole Lovell 1514. However, we do know that the conversations between the two of them were sexual. And David thought that the user Nicole Lovell 1514 was a 16, possibly a 17 year old girl. So, you know, just legal. And it's like, come on, David, can you not just find an 18 year old girl? Is it really that hard? You're at college, really? Because unfortunately, the girl, Nicole Lovell, 1514, was not 
a 16 or 17 year old girl. No, she was actually a 13 year old child. But apparently David didn't know this. Spoiler, he did. So David is having these very sexually charged conversations with a 13 year old middle school student. Now David has later on claimed that he truly, truly did not know that the person that he was talking to was only 13 years old. However, there is evidence from their chat logs that David did discover that Nicole was 13. When exactly he discovered she was 13, we don't know. However, we do know that he knew. And we also know that even after he found out that she was 13, the sexual conversations continued. And that is why I say David is kind of like the rarity here that he is also a teenager, very easily manipulated, very vulnerable still because he's still so young, but then he is also a predator. And these conversations that he was having with 13 year old Nicole would soon unravel in the most terrible of ways. But before we look at all of these conversations and everything that went on on kick, we first need to take a look at Nicole's life. Nicole Lovell was born on the 3rd of May, 2002, to parents Tammy Weeks and Dave Lovell. And Nicole had a very rocky start to life. Her parents separated before she was even born. And then her father had quite a few run with the law on drug charges. I'm pretty sure he went to prison, but I'm not 100% on that. But he just had some run-ins with the law and he wasn't really present in Nicole's life. Meaning that Tammy pretty much raised Nicole on her own. But not just that, soon after Nicole was born, she realized that Nicole's abdomen was swollen. So she took Nicole to the doctors and it was soon discovered that Nicole had a tumor in her liver. So at 10 months old, Nicole had a liver transplant and the surgery was successful and everything. However, she would now need to be on medication for the rest of her life. She would need to be on medication twice a day, like anti-rejection medicine. And this medication was keeping Nicole alive, but that wasn't it. When Nicole was only four years old, she was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to be exact. And then when she was in hospital, she developed MRSA which is a highly drug resistant bacteria infection. And then following this, Nicole developed acute respiratory syndrome, which is a life threatening illness. And then because of this, Nicole slipped into a coma for six months. You heard that right, she's in a coma for six months and doctors placed her survival rate at only one percent. And it's like, oh my God, Nicole is only four years old and she has already gone through all of that. And this was incredibly hard on Nicole. It was incredibly hard on her mother, Tammy, but Nicole was a fighter. After she came out of her six month coma, she went on to make a recovery and she returned home, which is just absolutely incredible. And knowing how much adversity Nicole has already faced in her short life makes this case so much worse. It makes it a million times worse. Tammy called her daughter God's gift. She called her her miracle child because Nicole really shouldn't have survived like everything that she did. So now we skip forward to Nicole being 13 years old. And Nicole had a great home life with her mom. They were so, so close. They were mother and daughter, but they were also basically best friends. So Nicole's home life was great. However, there was one problem. She didn't enjoy school. And why was that? Bullying. Now, Nicole had scars on her throat and on her stomach from surgeries that she had had. And kids bullied her because of her scars, because of her appearance. Kids also bullied her for her weight, which, oh my God, that makes me so, so angry. But Nicole had a terrible time at school. She hated being there and she hated taking part in gym class because she had to get changed in front of people and then they would see her stomach scar. But whilst Nicole was at home, she felt safe. Like home was her safe environment that she didn't have to face the bullying. She didn't have to face people. She could just be in her own little world with her mom. She loved singing and dancing around her bedroom. She loved country music, five seconds of summer. She had dreams of being on American Idol one day. She loved playing out in the snow with the younger children in the neighborhood. Her bedroom was full of her favorite characters from Minions and she loved pandas as well, like they were everywhere. Nicole's 
dad was also kind of back in her life a little bit at this point, so she was seeing him a little bit more. But it was Nicole and Tammy, like it was the two of them. They were each other's world. And they would have this really cute routine on the night. So their two bedrooms, they were adjoining and Tammy would quite often knock on the wall to try and get her daughter's attention. And then Nicole would come running in the room and they would have a little cuddle. Sometimes Nicole would also sleep in her mom's bed. And even though Nicole is 13 years old, so she's heading into that teenage life, that world, she was still a young girl at heart. However, even though she was a young girl at heart, there was one thing that would change all of that, and that was social media. After being bullied at school for so long, Nicole ventured online to try and find friends. She wanted any kind of attention or validation from anyone because she wasn't getting that at her school. And she's entering into that murky phase where she still feels like a child, she still has all childlike interests, but she's also becoming a teenager, so she wants to experiment a little bit more, dip her toe into the more adult world. And it was the more adult world that she started to explore online through social media. And it didn't take long for Nicole to enter into some very dangerous and damaging Facebook groups. And these groups were aimed at teen dating. Most of these groups were of teenagers posting selfies of themselves, sometimes a little bit more revealing, and asking others in the group to rate them. So these groups are basically around rating each other's attractiveness, which um, was basically what Facebook was created for. And as you can probably guess, this did not end well. Because most of the comments replying to these selfies where the person would say, rate me, most of the comments were negative because people are mean. Most of the comments were, ill, nah, never, barely a four. But then, as you've probably already figured out, these groups didn't just contain teenagers. Oh no, there were also predators in these groups. I mean, of course there were. This was another haven for child predators and child predators would be scanning these groups, scanning the posts and the comments, and they would leave comments on these posts saying things like, add me, send nudes, which again is not really too dissimilar to things that you find online now. And these groups were also full of explicit pornography. And these groups, most of the people were teenagers and they were being exposed to very graphic things. And sometimes it wasn't clear if this pornography, if the subjects were consenting adults, or children. And all of this was just easily available in private Facebook groups that pretty much had no monitoring. It's just insane. Well, I've told you about all of this because one morning at 3 a.m., Nicole was on one of these Facebook groups where you rate each other's attractiveness and she posted her own selfie. It was just a regular close-up selfie. She's pouting her lips. And alongside the photo was the caption, cute, or no. And this post received quite a bit of interaction. It got 304 replies, most of which were negative. The comments said things like, no, not cute. You're very round. The responses were just awful. People are really bold, aren't they, behind a computer screen? But it wasn't just this selfie and this post that was the problem, because Nicole started to come into contact with older predators on these Facebook groups. She started to be essentially groomed online. And these profiles, they would have profile pictures of young teenage boys. They would pretend to be teenagers, but they weren't. They were grown adults grooming her. And they would send her very explicit messages. They were probably sending her indecent images. They were probably asking her to take photos of herself to send to them. Now, thankfully, as far as I'm aware, Nicole never took any photos of herself. Her parents, actually discovered all of these Facebook messages before anything went too far. And her parents were absolutely horrified. I mean, you would be. And her parents, they made her delete her Facebook account. They confiscated her phone and they banned Nicole from all social media. However, over time, Nicole started to ask for her phone back. She started to beg for her phone back. And eventually her parents caved and gave her her cell phone back. And sadly, this is now where everything 
really does go downhill. Now we get back to late 2015. Nicole is still 13 years old and she decides to download the messaging app Kick. Now we don't know why Nicole downloaded this app. I can imagine though, it is because the app does have a reputation that it's parent proof. Now don't ask me why it's parent proof. I think it has something to do with the fact that it deletes messages or it doesn't have a history or it's just really hard to get into. I, I don't know, but it just has a reputation that is parent proof, which is why it is popular with teenagers. However, we do know in late 2015, Nicole was using Kick and she started messaging another person using that messaging app with the username Dr. Tombstone, which yes, that is a very, very lovely username. And if you hadn't already guessed, Dr. Tombstone was David Eisenhower. Now, like I said earlier, we don't quite know how David and Nicole started talking to one another or even exactly what they said. However, we do know that the conversations were very sexual. And we also know that David knew that he was having sexual conversations with a 13 year old child. However, after their first interaction on kick, David and Nicole would now go on to message each other every single day, multiple times a day. It was basically like the beginning of a relationship. They had really long conversations. They would share stories about themselves, their interests. They would be very flirty, sexually suggestive. And Nicole started to become absolutely infatuated by David. But it wasn't just Nicole. David also completely fell for Nicole. He has said that they had an emotional connection and David poured his heart out to Nicole. David soon realized that Nicole was from Blacksburg, Virginia which just so happens to be the exact same town that Virginia Tech University is located in. So not only is David being really inappropriate, essentially grooming this 13-year-old girl online, he also has very close physical proximity to her as well. And it wasn't long before Nicole actually believed that they were in a relationship. And you can't blame her for thinking like that. I mean, one, she's only 13 years old. But the things that David was saying to her, he was saying things like, one day they will run away together. They will get married. They will start a family. So it's like, of course, Nicole thinks that she's in a relationship with this person because of everything that they're saying to her. So now when Nicole goes to school, she starts going around telling everybody that she has an 18 year old boyfriend that she's speaking to online. She would tell people that he's really cute, that he's funny, that she's in love with him. She even changed her Facebook status to in a relationship. So yeah, Nicole clearly has Facebook again. But did David do anything to stop Nicole thinking this? No, of course he didn't because he's a groomer. I don't know if this is just me, but when you think of an online predator that is grooming a young child, you don't normally typically think about an 18 year old freshman in college, do you? At least I don't. And I just feel so sorry for Nicole because Nicole has gone through so much in her life. She is relentlessly bullied at school. She doesn't really have many friends at school. At least she doesn't have very deep, meaningful connections. So she's gone online to try and find friends, to try and find connections. And she stumbled into the dark world that can be social media. She stumbled into the wrong places. And now she's coming across predators. And because she's so vulnerable, because she is so so desperate to just be accepted, to get attention, to get love. It makes her incredibly vulnerable to people like David and people like David know this. And these conversations would go on for weeks, if not months between Nicole and David. And Nicole the whole time was getting more and more sucked into what David was telling her until eventually it got to the point where David didn't want to talk to Nicole anymore. Nicole, after finding out that they both lived in the same town, Nicole kept asking over and over again if they could meet in person. I mean, in Nicole's mind, they're boyfriend and girlfriend. So why wouldn't they meet? Especially because they live in the same town. But the penny finally dropped for David. And I think he finally realized, oh, maybe dating a 13 year old girl is not really the best idea. That's not a good look. I, I need to break this off. And poor Nicole was absolutely heartbroken. She didn't understand why David suddenly stopped talking to her, suddenly just wanted 
things to end ignored her. David had become everything to her. It was a pretty intense online relationship and because Nicole felt like she didn't really have anyone else but her mom, David had become her whole world. So she was truly heartbroken. And on the 3rd of January, 2015, Nicole sent David a message which said, quote, Dear David, you are my crush, but I know you don't think of me like that, but I don't care. I will always be here if you are looking for a good time. I'm here when you have a bad day. I'm here and I don't want that to change. I want to be in your life for as long as you can stand me. And I know I'm annoying and I ask for too much, but I'm a girl and I have a heart and feelings and my feelings get hurt a lot, but it's never been hurt by you. And I'm like that. So yeah, I'm too stupid to think that you actually want to stay in my life. But if you don't, I'll just have a life. Bye. Oh my God, Nicole truly thinks that, that in this committed relationship, she really has been sucked in by David. The fact that she just thinks that she's really annoying and that she's asking for too much. It's like, oh my God, it just breaks your heart. And then David says in response to that message, quote, so here's what I'm thinking. I'll give you some options. Number one, we take a break for a bit until I get back to a semi-normal routine, then I'll message you, a few weeks at most. Number two, we keep talking just as friends and see how that goes. Or number three, we don't talk again. And that made me really angry. I was like, the audacity. It's like she's a 13 year old girl. Why is he giving her these options? And we don't know how Nicole responded to this message. However, it's not hard to imagine that she was probably really hurt. She was probably hoping that one of those options that he gave her was for their relationship to continue. Especially because this boyfriend that she has online has been telling her that they are going to run away together one day, that they are going to get married, start a family. And now all of a sudden her boyfriend just wants to break it off for no apparent reason. So a couple of weeks pass and we don't know if the two of them continue communicating. We just don't know. But this is when things start to take an absolutely terrible turn and a lot of things happen all at once. And I'm not going to lie, this is quite confusing. Because one night, David went to a high school party in Blacksburg, which first of all, you're in college. Like, why are you still going to high school parties in a town where you are not from? So like, why are you doing that to begin with? Hmm, I'm suspicious. So apparently anyway, David is at this high school party. And remember that this is also the same town that Nicole lives in. And guess who apparently was also at this party? Nicole. Now I say apparently like this because there's no actual evidence that Nicole was even at this party. It is only David that claims that she was. Now, if I'm going to be completely honest, she's 13 years old. She's relentlessly bullied at school. She doesn't really have that many friends. She prefers to be at home. Why would a 13 year old middle school student be at a high school party? Just doesn't make sense to me, but I'm just going to leave it at that for now. But anyway, during this party, David, he was drinking a lot. He got very, very drunk. He apparently got blind drunk. Didn't know what he was doing. He was flirting with a lot of girls and he later woke up in a ditch. Now, the next day after the party, David started to get a ton of messages from people at the party saying that he was making out with a certain girl all night and that he was also messing around with this girl but David couldn't remember a thing he didn't know what he had done and he didn't know who this girl was but for some strange reason David started to worry that the apparent girl that he was messing around with at the party was 13 year old Nicole and then he also started to worry that messing around meant that he had slept with the girl. So now David is starting to worry that he has had sex with 13 year old Nicole. Now that is a big jump. I don't know how he jumped to that conclusion. And then also after the party, he started to receive a lot of messages from Nicole on the messaging app kick. And the messages were just the same messages that Nicole was always sending him that she missed him. She wanted him back. What could she do? Nothing about the party and nothing about them sleeping together. 
And according to David, now I want to stress that, according to David, Nicole apparently also sent David a message saying that if David didn't become her boyfriend again, she would expose their relationship to everyone and then also kill herself. But I want to stress again that it is only David that has claimed that. And then David made another huge leap and started to believe that Nicole was pregnant. Again, it's like, whoa, you've, you've missed out a few steps here. Number one, there is no actual evidence that Nicole was even at this party. Number two, messing around doesn't necessarily mean sleeping with somebody. And number three, why would you all of a sudden jump to the conclusion that Nicole, the 13 year old girl that you've never actually met in person is pregnant? There is no evidence that Nicole and David had any sexual contact ever. But for some reason, in David's warped mind, he became completely convinced that she was pregnant. Now, for David, this was his worst nightmare. Not because he had possibly had sex with a 13-year-old girl and impregnated her. Oh, no, 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 no. That was not the part that was his worst nightmare. His worst nightmare was that it was going to be revealed to the world that he had a relationship with a 13-year-old girl, and that would destroy his image, and he would never be able to repair his reputation. Remember, I told you that his image, his reputation, means the world to him. And I just feel like, well, you know what, David? If your reputation really does mean everything to you, why the hell are you starting a relationship with a 13-year-old girl online? Maybe just don't do that and you'll be fine. So what did David do in response to this revelation that his reputation was going to be completely destroyed? He thought that there was only one solution to all of this, one thing that would make his problems all go away, and that was to murder 13-year-old Nicole Lovell. And from this point forward, David starts to plan the murder. But does he do it on his own? Oh no. He calls his friend slash lover, whatever she is, Natalie Keepers to help out. And Natalie, instead of saying, no, no, I don't want to help you plan a murder of a 13 year old girl, because Natalie is obsessed with David and will literally do anything for him, she says, yes, of course I'll help you. According to Natalie, this made her feel like she was part of a club. She had a purpose. Murdering a 13 year old girl is, is not giving you purpose. In Natalie's words, she has described David as a sociopath and she has described herself as a sociopath in training. So over the next few days, David and Natalie start discussing how they are going to commit this murder and they discuss it all over kick. They contemplate poisoning Nicole. They clearly knew that Nicole was on medication, so they contemplated breaking into her home, taking her medication, swapping the pills out for cyanide pills. So she would take those cyanide pills and she would die. They also contemplated trying to make Nicole's murder look like a suicide. They contemplated essentially kidnapping her, knocking her unconscious, and then leaving her out in the cold just to die by the elements. And whilst they were having these conversations, David was making some worrying Google searches. His Google searches were how to destroy something. How to destroy something completely. Most creative ways to destroy things. He was trying to be a bit clever with his Google searches by not actually saying how to destroy like a body or a murder weapon or something. But then he slips up. He searches for how long does it take for a body to burn? What melts through flesh? What temp do bones burn? Tranquilizer. Knockout drugs. And also how does Dexter get rid of bodies. It's a TV show. And then after David had made these searches, he sent a little jokey message to Natalie, which said, quote, maybe bring some protection one of these times we hang out. What with all this that happened because I couldn't keep it in my pants. So basically David is texting Natalie to bring protection so they can have sex. And that he's joking around that they're in this mess, i.e 
planning the murder of a 13-year-old girl because David couldn't keep his penis in his pants and not impregnate a 13-year-old girl. And I still, for the life of me, cannot understand why he thinks he has gotten Nicole pregnant. Now you would hope that this evil pair were just joking around. Like they're not actually going to go through with this because this is just absolutely crazy. Like why are they planning to murder an innocent 13-year-old girl? However, sadly, this was not one big joke. They were being serious because because on the 26th of January 2016, this is when the tragic events of today's case take place. David and Natalie had decided on a knife attack. That is how they were going to kill Nicole. So David retrieved a knife from his college dorm room. Next, David and Natalie went to Walmart to buy supplies for the murder, which included a shovel. And they were caught on CCTV buying this shovel. And it's just so chilling when you see them at the checkout and David has this shovel. It's so chilling knowing what they're planning with all of this. They then go on a little date to finalise the plans, like further discuss everything. And part of their plan is that David was going to pretend to go on a date with Nicole. That is how he was going to lure her out of her home. So David messages Nicole saying things like, we should hang out. We should go on a date. We should go on a date tonight. Can you sneak out? Do not tell your mom. Nicole is absolutely infatuated with David. This must have been music to her ears. Of course, she is going to jump at the chance of going on a date with her boyfriend. David and Natalie go out and scope out a few places that they think will be appropriate for the murder. And then David dropped Natalie back at her dorm room. Natalie was not actually going to be there at the murder. So then after, David made his way over to Nicole's home. This was approximately around midnight. Now on this evening, Nicole and her mom, Tammy, they were at home like every other night and they had gone through their nighttime routine. Remember, like I said, they had adjoining rooms and sometimes Tammy would knock on the wall to get her daughter's attention. So then her daughter would go into her room and cuddle. Well, they didn't do this every single night. And on the evening of the 26th of January, Tammy didn't knock on the wall of her daughter. On this evening, Nicole was actually waiting for her mom to go to sleep so she could sneak out of the house to meet David. After her mom had fallen asleep, Nicole barricaded her bedroom door by placing a nightstand in front of it and then she snuck out of the home through the window and David was there waiting for her. Now obviously Nicole willingly got into his car because she thought that they were going on a date. However, that is not what happened and David drove Nicole out to the location that both him and Natalie had chosen earlier. And this was a really remote road into the mountains. And this was Craig Creek Road. Now, obviously we don't know, but I can assume Nicole was probably very confused at this point. Why had David driven her out to this really remote road? And tragically, after they arrived on Craig Creek Road, this is when David dragged Nicole out of the car. He struck her over the head with a blunt object, which actually broke a bone in her neck. And then sadly, he went on to stab Nicole 14 times times. And this is when Nicole Lovell lost her life. And it is just heartbreaking to think about the last moments of Nicole. Her autopsy actually showed that she was alive when her bone broke in her neck. She was alive through that. And after that, this was an incredibly frenzied, vicious attack. And Nicole was alive through most of it. She would have been in excruciating pain. She would have been so scared, so alone. And you just think about everything that Nicole has gone through in her life with all of her illnesses, the bullying, everything. And then for her life to end like this because of a groomer that she met online. Following the murder, David decides to leave Nicole's body in this remote wooded area. And he makes his way back to the campus and he arrives back to his dorm room at approximately 2 a.m. And this is when Natalie texts him for an update, which David responds chillingly, quote, it's done. The next morning, Nicole's mom, Tammy, woke up and she had expected to hear her daughter in her bedroom getting ready for school, just like any other morning. However, she just heard 
silence. But Tammy rushes over to Nicole's room, but the door has been barricaded and she cannot get in. So this makes her panic even more. She eventually makes her way into her daughter's bedroom and the first thing that she sees is that the window is wide open. And then she discovers that her daughter is missing. But then the third thing that she finds is that Nicole's medication is still in her room. Now this was the biggest red flag. Nicole had never snuck out before so obviously this was a red flag but Tammy knew that her daughter would never leave her medication behind. Nicole had to take this medication every single day to keep her alive. She phoned the police straight away and because of the age of Nicole and her condition with her medication it was urgent. So the FBI got immediately involved and the investigation went from zero to 100. The case was featured on local news. It was getting a lot of attention. There was lots of missing posters being handed out. Meanwhile, David is in his dorm room and he sees that Nicole's disappearance is everywhere on the news and he was not expecting that. One of his earlier Google searches was about missing children and whether they are found, how much attention they get. And clearly, David was thinking that no one would really pay attention to the fact that Nicole went missing, but he was wrong. So because her case was all over the news, he started to panic and he knew that he needed to move Nicole's body now. So this is when he calls up his friend slash lover Natalie again to ask her if she can help him move Nicole's body. And of course, like every time he asks her anything, Natalie says yes. So they drive out to Craig Creek Road where he left Nicole's body. They put her body in the trunk of the car and then they take a little trip to Walmart again and they go inside Walmart to get some cleaning supplies, you know, rubber gloves, bleach, blah, blah, blah. And what is just crazy to me is that they leave their car outside, obviously, but Nicole's body is in the car and they just go into Walmart like it's nothing. So then they go back out to the car. Now they need to decide, okay, so where are we going to bury Nicole's body. Now, initially, the plan was to bury Nicole's body on David's grandparents' land, which was in North Carolina. And again, I'm like, why would you bury her at your grandparents' house? Why would you do that? But the plan changes and the pair do cross state lines into North Carolina and they just find another remote road and just bury her body just off the side of the road. They strip Nicole of her clothes. They clean up up her body with bleach trying to remove any kind of DNA that they possibly could have left on her body and then they bury her in the woods. They then clean up David's car, try to remove any traces of blood that could be in there. Then they go to McDonald's because you know they're hungry after all of their hard work and whilst they are at McDonald's they dump all of Nicole's clothes in the dumpster and then after they finished up at McDonald's you know finish their Big Mac they then drive to another remote woodland area and dispose of the murder weapon. And then they go back to their dorm room and try and act like nothing has happened. And then we get to the next day. Detectives are working so hard to bring Nicole back, but it's not looking good because Nicole has now been missing for a day and she doesn't have her medication. However, they finally get a lead because one of Nicole's friends from school came forward to the police to tell them that Nicole had an online 18 year old boyfriend and that Nicole was planning on sneaking out of the home to meet him. Now this came at a huge shock to Nicole's parents but the police followed this lead and luckily Nicole had a post-it note of her social media passwords in her bedroom so police were easily able to get into her social media accounts. They went onto the messaging app Kick and they could see some of the chat history between Nicole and a user with the name Dr. Tombstone and the conversation Conversations between Nicole and Dr. Tombstone were very worrying because they were pretty sexual. So they knew that they had to track down this Dr. Tombstone. So detectives immediately got in contact with the company behind the messaging app Kick. And thankfully, they did help in this case because it was so urgent. And they handed over the email address linked to the account Dr. Tombstone. And luckily, David had used his real email address. He hadn't used a burner account. So because police had David's real email address, this was all they needed. And it wasn't long until they found out that Dr. Tombstone was actually 18-year-old David Eisenhower. 
were and that he was a student at Virginia Tech. So they tracked him down and they brought him in for questioning. Now, when police showed David the messages between himself and Nicole, David did his very best to try and wriggle out of this. He said that he was under the impression that Nicole was 16, maybe 17. We're talking and she's like, yeah, I'm 16 or 17. I do not remember the age she said. And that they had arranged to go on a date. But as soon as David saw how young she was, in David's own words, he actually said that she looked like an 11 year old. He got in his car and he drove off, leaving Nicole at her home alive. I get there and then I see someone who probably looked like she was 11 years old climb out of a window and I was like, uh oh, uh oh, uh uh, not for me. And that was that. That was the end of the story. So he's innocent. Can you let him go now? And David also revealed that he had an alibi for the murder. He was with a girl the whole night and she would be able to back up his story. So the police were like, well, who is this girl? And David was like, Natalie Keepers. Who's there? Her name is, uh... Natalie Keepers. Because David was convinced that Natalie would lie for him. So the police bring in Natalie Keepers for questioning. However, Natalie completely caved. She couldn't take the pressure of being in the police station, of being interviewed. And she gave a full and frank confession. We know that you have information about this. What do you think is falling out of your phone? She is driving. Okay, where is she? She told detectives all about David and Nicole's relationship and that David was convinced that he had gotten Nicole pregnant and he couldn't bear the thought of it being revealed to the world that he'd had a relationship with a 13 year old girl. And because of this, he decided that he was going to murder her. And Natalie did confess to her part in planning the murder. And then he stabbed her. He killed her in the in the woods the next day he told me that he needed help he forced know. me to move to help him move her body detectives ask natalie if she can lead them to where nicole's body is and she does and this is when it is no longer a missing person investigation for nicole because her body had been found and she had been murdered and after they discovered her body they had to break the news to her parents they also released a statement to the media and as you can imagine everyone was just devastated and after this both david and natalie were arrested david was charged with first degree murder and Natalie was charged with being an accessory. And two years later in 2018, David was to face trial first. Now at David's trial, they had an overwhelming amount of evidence. They had all of his online activity, his Google searches, everything. His cell phone had pinged off multiple towers that placed him in the area of the murder at Nicole's home where the body was found. Turns out that they didn't actually clean the car that well because they found DNA evidence of Nicole in the car. There was literally no way out of this for David. And in the trial, the motives for the murder were discussed. And the only motive that has been put forward is that David was convinced that Nicole was pregnant and he just couldn't bear the thought of this coming out, so he murdered her. However, after her autopsy, it was revealed that Nicole was not pregnant. Shocker. And then a few days into his trial, David was informed that all of his messages between himself and Nicole on kick were going to be revealed and read out in court. And I'm talking all of their messages going right back to the very beginning of their relationship. And it seems like David really didn't want these messages to come out. Because before these messages could be read out in court, David changed his plea. As soon as he found out that his chat history with Nicole was going to be revealed to the world, he panicked and he changed his plea to no contest. Which basically means that he's not pleading guilty, but he's not contesting any of the evidence and there is enough evidence to convict him. So he's basically pleading guilty. It's confusing, but he's basically pleading guilty. So then because he pled guilty, the trial ended and no messages were read out in court. Now I have a few theories on why he didn't want these messages read out. I personally think that these messages would have revealed a much darker side to David. I think they would have shown the true nature of a child predator 
that he was. And we all know how child predators are treated in prison. And I don't think David wanted those messages to see the light of day. Because right now, because we don't know what these messages say, like it's really frustrating, we don't know what the messages between Nicole and David say. So because we don't know what they say, David still has plausible deniability in prison. He can still say, I'm not a child predator. I genuinely thought that she was 16 or 17. But obviously we have no way of actually knowing what these messages said. So that is just my theory. So then David needed to be sentenced and he was sentenced to 60 years in prison for the murder. 10 years for the abduction and five years for concealing a body, which totals 75 years in prison. And then later on that year in August of 2018, it was Natalie's trial. And in the end, she was also found guilty of being an accessory to murder. And she was sentenced to 40 years in prison. And that was the case of David Eisenhower and also kind of Natalie Keepers, even though it, it was mostly David like this whole thing was about David, Natalie was still involved. And this is one of those cases where I just keep scratching my head because I just truly don't understand how it all happened. Like I really don't understand the way David and Natalie's mind works. They murdered an innocent 13 year old girl because David thought that he had gotten her pregnant, even though there's actually no evidence that they ever met before the night of the murder. I, I don't even think they ever met. So then my mind starts ticking because I'm like, there must be another answer here. There must be another reason why they murdered this innocent child. And I think that he murdered Nicole for one of two reasons. I think he either murdered Nicole because maybe Nicole did threaten to reveal their relationship to the world. And we all know how much David's image means to him. And it clearly means so much to him that he will murder an innocent little girl over it. Or the simple answer is that he was a child predator and he wanted to murder a child. Maybe it's both of them. Who knows? And as for Natalie, I mean, I know that she was in an abusive relationship and that she was also vulnerable to David's manipulation, but it's just no excuse. Like she barely even knows David and yet she agrees to murder a 13 year old girl with him. I, I mean, I know she didn't actually murder Nicole, but she was a part of the plan. She helped conceal her body. And at any point she could have gone to the police to stop it all. And I just feel so sorry for Nicole and her family, everything that they had to go through. I mean, Nicole went through so much adversity in her short life. She had overcome so many obstacles and then she was just murdered in such a cold, senseless way. And it's just truly, truly heartbreaking. And I want to end this video remembering Nicole. Nicole Lovell was described as a sweet and caring young girl with a huge heart. She loved singing and dancing. Her favorite color was blue. Her favorite animal was a panda. But most of all, she loved spending time with her mom, Tammy who was absolutely her best friend. Nicole was such a young child at heart and she had so much more to give to this world. She would be 21 years old if she was still alive right now. She was only 13 years old. So that brings us to the end of this absolutely heartbreaking case. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below, because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video, and I'll see you all in my next one. Bye.